spores make up 50, roughly 50% 50 of what the next generation is, right? And so without the bore and it running at optimal levels, uh, we kind of have some problems there and we want to keep the bore going and providing viable sperm that has good fertility. And uh, I think that starts with what we feed them. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Ta Scaff, a swine extension specialist and assistant professor at North Dakota State University. So Ta, before we begin, would you mind giving the audience a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah. So uh, as you said, my name is Ta Scaff, uh, serving as the swine extension specialist here at North Dakota State. Uh, previous to this, I was a PhD student at Purdue University under Dr. Kara Stewart and Brian Rickard. And prior to that, I did my bachelor's and master's at Oklahoma State, where I'm originally from. Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. So we talk a lot on this podcast about nursery pigs, finishing pigs, and sows, but I don't have many conversations about boar nutrition. And I understand from your PhD work that you did at Purdue that you did a lot of research regarding boars and boar nutrition. So to start, why is boar nutrition so important? Well, just to kind of put it in uh, general terms here is that boars make up 50, roughly 50% 50 of what the next generation is, right? And so without the boar and it running at optimal levels, uh, we kind of have some problems there and we want to keep the boar going and providing viable sperm that has good fertility. And uh, I think that starts with what we feed them. Gotcha. So like you said, when it comes to the boar, what we really care about is that sperm viability. Um, so I guess my, my next question then would be, when it comes to the nutrition of the boars, does it really matter what we feed them as long as we are hitting that benchmark of achieving the production of viable sperm? Or is there really more to it when we look down into the nutrition? Well, I think if we are planning for the future, uh, you know, we have AI technologies that continue to develop and advance, and uh, we're looking at using less and less uh, billions of sperm per dose, especially if we're looking at PCAI or deep uterine AI. Uh, that's something we got to take into account is, you know, if I do have a large quantity of sperm, I have a higher chance of getting conception or that's the that's what's thought right where if we go to those lower numbers we are reducing that possibility of conception even further so if we're not uh, providing that boar with adequate nutrition to provide to that semen and sperm so that it can uh, successfully make it to the ovary uh, I think that's where we need to kind of reevaluate and look at that as it, as we continue to decrease uh, the AI dose of sperm, how can we get that benchmark higher of what we're looking for with motility and morphology and all that? Gotcha. So when you're looking at it from a nutrition aspect, how would you say that nutrition impacts the typical characteristics of sperm, such as motility? Yeah, just uh, some of my research uh, that was done at Purdue, uh, we fed boars some low diets, uh, what I would consider or boars that were fed under uh, maintenance requirements at maintenance and above maintenance. And we saw that if you feed those boars under their maintenance energy requirements for an extended period of time, our study was nine weeks, and then a crossover study of another nine weeks, uh, it really impacted some of those parameters. Uh, we saw volume decrease, and eventually some of those boars would even just stop collecting in general. And on the contrary, when they got too large, uh, we saw them kind of get lazy. They didn't have a ton of libido. Uh, they didn't really want to get up and go to the collection dummy because there wasn't that, what I would call that sense of reward after they collected uh, to then go back and be like, 
okay, now I'm hungry. They were, well, I'm full all the time. I can just sleep. I don't care about anything else. So you mentioned a few different technologies that are out there, such as PCAI, that are designed to reduce the amount of sperm that you use per dose. But what kind of technologies are out there when it comes to sperm and the bore? Yeah, so I'm not an exact expert in this, but I'll do my best to go through it. So PCAI, I know the normal semen dose is roughly about 3 billion sperm. And as we look at PCAI, that gets past the uh, block of the cervix. So PCAI stands for post-cervical artificial insemination. And that would just be another way to push that sperm further into that uterine body or horn so that past the cervix so that uh, you're not losing as much uh, in the cervix and all the folds and interdigitating pads that are there. Uh, and also with deep uterine AI, that goes a little bit further, again, with uh, internal catheter. And really what these are looking at is uh, reducing the number of sperm that is needed, but also maximizing that uh, bore's uh, collection, essentially. So how can we get that sperm passed, but also get more out of these uh, high indexing bores that we have, more doses. Gotcha. And then also looking at some other different types of research, what all research is out there over the last few decades, specifically looking at the bore? Uh, so I know uh, Dr. Carl Kearns at Iowa State does some bore research. Uh, Dr. Stewart, uh, she's always very interested in doing bore research. Uh, as far as that, I know there's some other universities uh, I believe Dr. Knox at Illinois does some bore research. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's kind of aged out. Really, a lot of the bore research that has been done was conducted in the late 80s and early 90s uh, by a gentleman with the last name of Kemp. And he kind of set the standard of bore nutrition and looking at that and how it impacts semen. But that's, you know, it's 2025 looking at that. It's probably... 30 to 40 years old. So with our genetic advancement, how relevant is that to today? Or can we use that as kind of a groundwork to move on with research? And last question I have for you is I know you just recently started here at NDSU, but when you look into your research side of things there, do you plan to do more bore research there? Or what does your path really look like going forward at NDSU? Uh, yeah, so I do have a very, most of my appointment here is extension. Uh, however, I do have a research appointment, and looking at that, I am looking to get into more bore research, whether that's continuing some of the work uh, I did with my PhD with looking at energy levels and if we can find that exact uh, kind of right energy level for that growing bore as it gets into its uh, mature size, I would say. And uh, also, prior to that, as we're rearing these animals, uh, how can we set them up or are there some sort of parameters that we can look at prior to uh, them getting into collection that will give us some indicators of what a good uh, boar would be in the stud. Awesome. Well, I believe that's all the time we have. So thank you again, Tal, for coming on the show and sharing all your research with us. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Yep. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week.